Thanks for being here. Thanks for being on time. If you are in the right place, and if I am in the right place, then this is History 105, a chronicle of the stand. My name is Peter Goldsmith. You can call me Professor Goldsmith or just plain old Pete. Peter, I'm comfortable with all of the above. This semester we will be studying a dark but important subject, the event that you all grew up knowing as the Great Plague, and we will be learning about its aftermath and the creation of the Free Zone, as well as a conflict that has become known as the Stand. But today I want to provide an overview of the A-prime flu, focusing on the two-week period from patient zero to the near extinction of the human race. Now, as it says on the syllabus, my lectures do not pull any punches. They will be honest and at times disturbing, but it is vital for each new generation to learn about what took place almost 35 years ago. So, let's begin. Every other history class before now has shown you how humanity's advancement has been tied to the advancement of war. Every technological breakthrough has been weaponized, and with each passing century, the deadliness of those weapons has increased exponentially. Many believe that the zenith of our destructive powers arrived at the invention of the atomic bomb, but they were wrong. The decimation came not from an explosion, but from a test tube. Sometime during the 20th century, we aren't sure exactly when, a secret branch of the United States government built a laboratory in the deserts of California. The men and women who worked at this facility had two jobs. One the creation of the deadliest viruses this planet has ever seen, and two, keeping those viruses contained. They succeeded in the first task, and they failed miserably in the second. On June 13th, 1990, at 2.37 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, there was the mother of all accidents. We will never know exactly what went wrong, but we do know that that virus was released at that very minute, and it quickly spread through this facility. This is what we now know as the Project Blue Compound. It is bigger than it looks. Most of the structure is 600 feet under the earth. When that virus was released through that facility, the security system was supposedly designed to lock everything down. But there was a malfunction, and the security system did not activate quickly enough because one soldier escaped. That man was Charles D. Campion, a soldier and a deserter. He gathered his wife and his child and drove off into the night. In his mind, he probably thought that he was saving the life of himself and his family. However, unbeknownst to him, he was already contaminated with the virus. And what is this virus exactly? Well, you've probably heard your, your parents refer to this as Captain Trips or the Super Flu. Its technical name is 848AB or the A prime flu. It was developed in part by a Nobel Prize winning scientist, Dr. Emmanuel Eswick, who you'll be perhaps bitterly pleased to know was one of the first people to die on the compound. Every soldier and scientist locked inside Project Blue died within minutes 
So why didn't Campion die as suddenly? We're not sure, but we believe that the virus was ever shifting, ever evolving, and it was perhaps temporarily dormant in Campion, at least for a brief period. Then, as Campion and his family drove east, they developed the symptoms that would become both infamous and deadly. Sneezing, nasal congestion, fever, swelling of the throat, of the glands, severe weakness, eventually hallucination, insanity, then death. The Campion family. This is them. That is Charles Campion. That is his wife, Sarah. That is little baby Levon. They traveled over 48 hours, taking back roads to avoid being found. We don't know how many stops they made along the way or how many people they infected. During the drive from the Mojave Desert to the town of Arnett, Texas, the Campion family must have suffered from these symptoms. Delirious and behind the wheel, Campion drove the car into a Texaco gas station. The date was June 16th. Six men rushed to help the family, only to find that the wife and child were dead and the husband was close to dying. Those six men were all exposed to the virus. We know their names. Bill Haskam, Norman Bruett, Tommy Wanamaker, Henry Carmichael, Victor Palfrey, and a man you probably have heard of and perhaps have even met, Stuart Redman. Arnett is a very small town, 110 miles outside of Houston along Route 93. When the government was eventually notified of Campion's whereabouts, they hoped to contain the town of Arnett. Why? Because as you already know, the A prime flu was highly contagious. It wasn't long before five of those six men began to show symptoms of their own. That night, those men would go home and unknowingly spread the virus to their loved ones. Volunteer ambulance drivers took Charles Campion to the hospital, and the AWOL soldier died en route, but not before passing the virus to the EMT workers, who would then pass it along to dozens, if not hundreds, of hospital workers. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, why didn't the government stop this? Well, they tried. The man in charge of containing this virus was named General William Starkey. He served as the commanding officer in charge of Project Blue, and under his orders, army soldiers and other government operatives swept into Arnett, Texas. But by then, the virus was no longer contained to that town. On June 18th, the six men who came into contact with Campion were taken into quarantine along with their families and transported to Atlanta's Center for Disease Control. And by then, the government must have known how widespread and dire the situation was. However, under Starkey's orders, the press was not to be informed of the truth. By June 19th, the patients brought into Atlanta began to die. Some more quickly than others. Everyone was ill except for Stuart Redman. He still showed no symptoms baffling the medical staff and the government operatives. By June 20th, urgent care waiting rooms began to fill. Hospitals were overcrowded. Emergency rooms flooded. By now, thousands of people were exhibiting cold and flu symptoms, and no one was getting better. This escalated over the next couple of days, and then on June 23rd, the army had quarantined at least five entire towns, Arnett, Verona, Commerce City, Polliston, and Sipes Springs, Texas. Two reporters from the Houston press tried to get past this roadblock. We're gonna have to surrender the video camera that gentleman's holding and any videotape you may have already shot. Can you tell us why, Major? You don't seem to understand the situation here, ma'am. Martial law has been declared. We don't have to put up with you and your pinko friends anymore. Mike, are you getting all this? Get him! Get him! Get him! Get this rifle! Stop! 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 
whether the citizens of the United States knew it or not, martial law had taken hold. The military cut phone lines in towns and cities with high infection rates. Fake road construction crews, military men in disguise, blocked off highways. Roads were torn up in hopes of preventing travel. This, of course, did nothing to slow the escalation of so-called Captain Trips. By June 24th, Stuart Redman had been transported from Atlanta to a facility in Stovington, Vermont. The Center for Disease Control had lost control. The military continued to run tests on Stuart Redman. In fact, unbeknownst to Redman, they injected the virus into his veins just to see what would happen, and nothing happened. He killed the virus, but they had no idea how or why. They could find no conclusive reason as to why Redman was immune. News reports on television failed to mention the quarantined cities and towns, but they were finally reporting a little bit of medical news, what they labeled as a Russian strain of flu. They did admit that it was causing an epidemic on the East Coast, but any deaths that had occurred so far were blamed on the AIDS virus. To the general public, A prime superflu did not officially exist. But now, even newscasters were showing symptoms during live broadcasts. Listen to this sneeze. Side of town on the I-15. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> A live sneeze. <laughs> Much of the information I will tell you next comes from classified documents. Of course, they aren't classified anymore since the United States no longer exists. George Bush, the last American president, fired General Starkey, and the shambling Project Blue was now the responsibility of General Lynn Creighton. Both generals had known each other for decades. They were fellow soldiers, friends. And we know from Creighton's account that Starkey entered the Project Blue facility, took the elevator down several floors to the cafeteria, where he stood among dozens of untouched bodies. There had been one particular soldier, Private Frank Bruce, who had died with his face in a bowl of soup. According to Creighton's notes, this deeply disturbed General Starkey, and so as a last act, Starkey went down into the cafeteria and he lifted the corpse's head out of the soup bowl, cleaned off the face of the dead soldier with his handkerchief, and then Starkey walked out of the cafeteria, he sat down next to a different corpse, and shot himself. Now. Before you feel sympathy for Starkey, know this. When he relinquished his command, he advised his fellow general to give the order to release the virus. All over the world, government agents placed through Europe and Asia, they had been given vials of A prime flu. The virus was unleashed in just about every continent. This doomed the entire planet, and the generals did this so that the world would not know the source of the virus. This was the U.S. government's last delusional attempt to bury the truth. Throughout the days on June 25th, 26th, 27th, hell is unleashed. One of Starkey's favorite poems, according to Creighton, was William Butler Yeats's The Second Coming, which has the famous line, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And that is what happened to our society over the course of the last days of the virus. The nightly news on ABC led with a story of the superflu epidemic. This is one of the few news reports to publicly discuss this. But they claimed that a vaccine was being developed and it would be distributed within 
a week. This was a new lie. There was no vaccine. All public gatherings were canceled and people were now beginning to panic. Student activists all over the country, such as the students at the University of Kentucky, they saw through the deception and began spreading their own posters and pamphlets, their own form of counter information. And they were not the only ones to rebel. The staff of TV station WBZ in Boston had been broadcasting censored versions of the news for over a week. All the while, they were working under the thumb of armed soldiers. Amazingly, the news staff surprised and disarmed the soldiers, and anchorman Bob Palmer revealed the facts that had since then been clouded by fiction. The news now broadcast never-before-seen footage of the Boston General Hospital. It was filled beyond capacity. Patients were on the floors of every hallway. In Boston Harbor, there were truckloads of bodies being poured onto a barge. These images and others were shown throughout this technically illegal two-hour and 15-minute broadcast. Then the studio's power was shut down, and Bob Palmer and the entire news staff, everyone on the sixth floor, was captured and executed for treason. This was not the only broadcast to end in bloodshed. In Springfield, Missouri, a popular radio show host tried to listen to callers as they explained their observations live on the air. What's your name, Portsmouth? Leonora. <laughs> Listen, Ray, I just want everyone to know that there are soldiers burning bodies across the state line in Kittery. Also, my, my little girl died this morning. I guess she's with Jesus. You try to hang in there, Lenora. I'm trying, Ray, but if you ever smell bodies on fire... <laughs> can't say that I have. It's awful, Ray. It's just... You just try to hang in there, hon. Open in the name of the United States government. Folks, I've just been ordered by my uninvited fascist guest to shut down, and I've refused. Right, I think... According to military communications, the radio host, Ray Flowers, was shot by Sergeant T.L. Peters. But this act of murder revolted his soldiers so much that they shot their own sergeant such forms of mutiny began to spread like wildfire. At Kent State University, 2,000 students joined in a protest. They marched across campus, and as soon as they crossed the quarantine border, the police and military mowed down the students with machine gun fire. This act led to more desertions, led to more mutinies, led to more violence, soldier versus soldier. From June 25th and June 26th, all throughout the cities of America, chaos ensued. Those who had not yet succumbed to the illness either rioted, looted, fled, or hid in their homes. The military fell into disorder, coup after coup occurred, and the superflu raged on. In Portland, Maine, a man in a loincloth performed 62 executions live on television. And the last gasp of authority came from the president's address at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. My fellow Americans, I urge you to stay at home. If you feel ill, let me repeat what I said at the beginning of my talk to you this evening. There is no truth to the rumor that this strain of flu is fatal. In the greatest majority of cases, the person afflicted can expect to be up and around and feeling fine within a week. By June 27th, anyone left alive would wake up feeling very lonely. Because by then, you are either bedridden with illness or you were one of the survivors. One of the 
0.06% of people left on the planet. If you walked out your door and down the street, you would see no one. No one walking down Hollywood Boulevard. No one jogging through Central Park. You would, however, find corpses everywhere. On the benches of subway stations. Behind the steering wheel, stuck in traffic. In churches, in hospitals, in apartments, in homes. On June 12th of 1990, the day before the dawn of Captain Tripp's, the American population was just over 250 million. By July 1st, over 99% of the population had perished. Today we calculate that this strange new world, this post-Captain Tripp's world, had only 1.26 million people who had not only survived the virus, but also the violence. Society had fallen, and those who remained must learn how to stand up again. But that, folks, is a lesson for another day. Think about what I've said. Class dismissed.